I went to someone in a community where I was working and I she had written a book and she kind of did some author coaching and I shared all my ideas. I had a lot of mental health topics that I wanted to write about. I wanted to write about anxiety, depression, ADHD. I just had like this long list of books that I wanted to write and I, I asked her, you know, which one do you think would interest you or, you know, the public the most? And she started talking to me about ADHD. And she started sharing her own personal experience with her child having ADHD and, and them not really knowing which way to go and the school not really always knowing how to support. And as she was sharing that with me, I um, started to think about myself and I started to think about my own life and I was like, you know, in the back of my head, I always thought that I also had ADHD, but I didn't have the resources to get diagnosed. At that point, I just kind of started doing a lot of research. Uh, my, my master's final project ended up being about ADHD. So I'm just learning all of these things and it's still sounding familiar. Um, and then, through this process, my own daughter started having some difficulties in school. I started to notice that it was a little bit harder for her. Um, and I got reports from the teacher that she was standing up a lot in class, that she had trouble sitting still, that she was talking to everyone around her. Classic ADHD. Uh, and so the school, just like this parent shared with me, wasn't really sure what to do with that or what it was. So. I first went to her pediatrician. I had been in the room with this doctor for maybe two minutes and she told me, um, I don't think she has ADHD because she's hyper. Or she's not hyper. Usually when we see children in the office with ADHD, we know right away because they're bouncing off the walls. Uh, and through my research that I've been doing, I knew that wasn't the case, that children who had ADHD were not always hyper, even though she was hyper, she just hadn't been in that very moment. And so I said, okay, thank you. And she's like, well, we could still do the assessment. I was like, I don't want you to do any assessments um, because at that point, I really wanted to be sure that if we were to get a diagnosis, that whoever did it knew exactly what they were doing and knew how to get the right um, results. I waited a little bit and we ended up going to a psychologist that specialized in ADHD. And through kind of talking to them and them talking to her, we got the diagnosis of ADHD. We started kind of walking through what the next steps were in improving her school and all of that. And kind of through that process, her reading scores tripled through treatment for ADHD. And in my heart as a mom, I knew from the beginning that that's what it was. I mean, she was brilliant from, she was talking early, she talked very clear. You could have a conversation with her like she was 30 at like two. Um, and so I knew that her not being able to catch on to certain ideas as fast was a concentration issue in my observation. And that's something that I see a lot uh, in my work now. As a parent, there are things that I need to do to support her in her diagnosis. Um, but I was having trouble being consistent as well because I also had ADHD and I had not been diagnosed and I didn't know. It was something that I always felt but didn't ever, like I said, I wasn't able to get the proper diagnosis. Eventually, I got my own psyche eval uh, at, I think I was 26 when I was first diagnosed. And so I was able to get the care that I needed to be able to provide the structure that she needed. Uh, and this is something that's not uncommon. Um, ADHD is just about as hereditary as eye color. So 50% of the time, if your child has ADHD, you, the parent, one of the parents or both of the parents probably also has ADHD. So this is something that I learned academically through statistics, but also learned personally that a lot of parents learn that they uh, have ADHD once they learn that their child has ADHD because a lot of the things that their child is dealing with, they then start to look back and think, wow, that was me too. Um, but especially since mental health is growing so quickly, there were a lot of things when I was a child that we just didn't know and that we know now. Well, growing up, um, I didn't hear anything about ADHD. How do I think other people would define it? Um, 
a lot of people think that we tend to be maybe like out of control or not having the ability to be in control of certain situations where as I feel like we tend to have more control in chaotic situations so I think one of the things about ADHD people don't really understand it even people who have been diagnosed with ADHD as I became a teacher and worked in different teaching environments I would say that I noticed other teachers thinking that children who were overly active more than the others um, saw them kind of as problem children. People not understanding ADHD, um, you know, kind of joke about it. It's kind of offensive because if you have been in um, a situation where you've experienced not being able to accomplish things, um, being down and frustrated simply because you can't remember something, um, you wouldn't talk about it. More or less just uh, inability to pay attention or stay interested in anything for too long. There is a stigma around it where, you know, people with ADHD are super hyper or they don't listen, they don't focus. Anytime, you know, there is a disconnect, it, you know, it must be the ADHD that kicked in. A lot of people think of it as a deficit. There's actually three types of ADHD. Um, and so now instead of there being ADD and ADHD, there's just one diagnosis and there's a reason for that, which I'll explain later. Um, and so with ADHD, there's hyperactive type, there is inattentive type, and then there's combined type. So someone who has hyperactive type will have your stereotypical um, ener high energy, um, kind of moving from thing to thing, um, and then the inattentive type might just be someone who they seem or appear to be disengaged because sometimes they are having trouble concentrating. Um, and then there's combined type where people have a combination of both of those things. And the reason why they made it one diagnosis, just ADHD now, is because people can change throughout their lifespan. And they've also found that actually um, the hyperactivity part is still present in those with inattentive type in that the hyperactivity is happening inside their minds. And so as a lot of people say, they have so many different ideas and so many different things happening in their minds uh, throughout the day. That's also kind of a form of hyperactivity as well, as well as kind of fidgeting and feeling uh, restlessness on the inside, those are all types of hyperactivity that people might not recognize that way. Something that is funny about ADHD is you really need structure. You need some, you know, some kind of external structure to tell you where you need to be when um, and what you need to do when. And however that works for you, sometimes it's not like external structure, like someone's literally telling you what to do. Sometimes you need to create that for yourself or create some kind of system of accountability for yourself. But we also really hate it. So it's like that balance. Um, but I forgot where I was going with that, which is what happens to me all the time. Um, but yeah, oh, so a lot of people, school works for them because they have that structure of classes at certain times and all of that. So people who are not diagnosed as children who kind of thrive in the structured environment sometimes fall apart when they get to college. And especially in my master's program is when I started to realize that I was really, my, my old coping skills were not working for that part of my life anymore. Um, I would thrive off of procrastination and waiting to the last minute if I had something due at midnight I would start it at 10 and it, I'm talking like eight page ten page papers I would start them at 10 and they were due at midnight um, and I literally couldn't bring myself to do things any earlier than that that is how I functioned always and with the structure of school and the fact that that was always the case I was able to get by with that um, but then fast forward to graduate school, it wasn't always an option for me to start something at 10 that was due at, at midnight because master's level work is a whole different ball game. Um, and, and having to be at an internship and having to be at work and having to balance all of that with um, just personal life and organizing and all of that, I started to realize I need to actually do something about this. 
So um, I think a lot of professionals assume that someone with ADHD, like, oh, like how, so when I first went to get diagnosed, before I actually went to a psychologist, I also went to a doctor. And that doctor kind of looked at me like, you're in a master's program. How, how is it possible that you have ADHD? How did you survive this long? And really I had developed so many coping skills that I, I knew I survived, but I knew I was working harder than everybody around me to do it. Um, and so I think the misconception is that you can't be good in academics when you have ADHD, but um, people get by and some people are better than others with getting by. So I, for me, the time where I knew I couldn't do it without help anymore was graduate school. So when I finally got the diagnosis, I, I originally thought I would like, you know, just like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm doing this. But as, you know, the test went on, I, was like, what, it you know, became a real thing. And so um, some of my, you know, anxiety kind of came out during that. And so it really made me think and reflect on different things that was, you know, was impacting just my life. And so after, you know, the, they told me that I was actually, and I was actually diagnosed with ADHD, I cried. <laughs> so um, I, was, I was kind of emotional and um, and it, I was emotional because I, for a while, thought something was wrong with me. And so it was kind of a relief to know that, you know, this wasn't my fault. Like, I didn't have an issue, you know. I wasn't broken, I guess. And so, um, yeah, it was kind of a relief, but it was definitely a, a heavy thing in some parts. I was a good student. I did enjoy school a lot. I was definitely a lot more active. I'm a C student and I'm proud of it. Um, I mean, I, that was my high school GPA I graduated with. I still haven't completed um, my higher education. I'm still trying to get my associates. I have a little bit higher of a GPA. I was also having issues, you know, the same issues kind of following on with the unorganized locker, um, forgetting homework. Um, and just kind of barely breezing by until college came about and that's kind of when you are more independent. In second grade, my teacher had me do this because I would fidget so much and touch other people. I was so intrigued by the tactileness of the wood and the building and I really preferred to be there creating in the corner rather than interacting with my peers. And then I quickly changed my major, uh, like a lot of kids do, um, and was a dance major, and that only lasted for about a semester, and I went back and did hospitality management. Um, and then ultimately dropped out after attempting about three times. Um, but I was able to get a job um, within the hospitality industry, which kind of didn't um, make me want to go back um, to school. I also think that the ADHD isn't the lone independent factor for why I might struggle in school at times. A lot of it is just, um, you know, a matter of what's going on in my life personally and the fact that I also have serious depression too could be a little bit of column A, column B, but uh, I don't think it's necessarily helped me academically. I attended three HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. So I started out at Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I played basketball and ran cross country. I later transferred to the Lemoyne Owen College where I received my bachelor's in computer science and that's in Memphis, Tennessee. Then I went on to Jackson State University, which is in Mississippi, to get a master's in computer science. And later I became the first black woman to earn a PhD in computer science from Purdue. Um, so that's my, that's my educational journey. When we first noticed ADHD for my daughter, it was kindergarten. Um, and with her being a younger kindergarten, I know that uh, disproportionately younger kindergartners are diagnosed with ADHD 
um, because they are just more immature than the other kids in their class. So I gave it some time um, until first grade to kind of see how the first grade was gonna go. I didn't say anything to the teacher, I kind of let it be. Um, and I just ended up getting phone calls again, like clockwork, like kindergarten and first grade. Um, but the teacher had a different perspective of what she thought was going on, especially given that, you know, I was a young mom and from her perspective, her being chatty meant that she was trying to get adult attention or she needed attention. Um, and I knew like we are always with her. She has so much support at home. Our learning letters was taking a little bit longer than we thought it should for her intelligence level, which is a common marker that in ADHD. So we had a little back and forth with the school about that. I was a little offended, I'm not gonna lie. I think, uh, you know, I tried my best as a parent and then the teacher's telling me that the reason she's acting out is because of all of these things I'm not doing. Um, so that, that was a struggle and we finally got the diagnosis and we finally did the whole process of having her observed at school by like a school psychologist and having the teacher fill out a questionnaire and all that. Um, we were finally able to get the right answer and when the teacher saw how quickly she began like excelling with the help, um, we all knew that the issue was in fact ADHD. My definition of ADHD. Um, how do I define it? Um, I mean, it's a cognitive disability. So it hinders you in ways and uh, kind of exacerbates other skills that you might have innately, so. There are some behaviors, there are some things that can be controlled, but it's, it, it's not a thing that you just, you know, you click on. You, on and off. The ways that I do things are usually different. And so because they're different and my approach is different, sometimes people don't understand that. And when people don't understand something, sometimes they'll criticize it or become fearful of it. Being misunderstood has been difficult. Just having like a really fast brain, if that makes sense. Like, that's the best way for me to put it in ADHD terms because with us we kind of have to put it in like a story rather than an exact uh, definition. But it's mostly just like having a really fast brain, but then you have like those like outward barriers. So like when you're speaking, sometimes it's difficult to speak um, because your brain is just going so fast. Giving people grace and also people with ADHD giving themselves grace and time to understand, you know, what ADHD means and what it looks like. Because it's also not a thing that's the, it looks the same for everyone. Finances can be hard for people with ADHD for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, impulse control being one of those things and um, difficulty planning. Um, for the future so you might have money and impulsively shop but then forget the fact that you have um, certain bills due at a certain time and so payday you buy all these things and then on the 15th you realize oh man you know I actually had this bill due now and I don't have the money because I impulsively spent it early on and that's part of kind of the um, executive dysfunction as they call it that um, people with ADHD have where they struggle with planning ahead and um, planning for different things, not even just finances, but also, you know, being certain places on time and what have you. And so for a, for a number of different reasons, finances can get a little wacky. And then there's that added layer of the fact that this plays a part in the education thing as well. I think it's about 40 or 50% of people with ADHD also have a learning disability as well. So that might be dyslex dyslexia um, or dyscalculia, which is a math disorder that we still don't know a lot about. Um, so when it comes to managing finances, if someone also has one of those learning disabilities, that can make it even harder to manage finances. Oh man, impulse buying. So I do a lot of that um, and it's, it's easy to get um, sold. Like I'm a salesperson's like best friend. Financially, I feel like I 
unfortunately was unable to get a proper grasp on how finances work. Definitely as I've gotten older, learning how to budget in a more effective way, um, and then knowing you know, that I can kind of lose track of things sometimes, um, it has, you know, I, I just I just put more focus in some of those areas. I'm not really good with numbers. So I, you know, like for my business, I have to have an accountant. And it's kind of a joke because when I come in, she's like, oh, Angie. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's not horrible, but it's, my processes are different than, she's an accountant, you know. The, biggest issue for me personally, and I think with a lot of ADHDers, is that impulse control. Um, and so when we have that money, it's like that saying where it's like burning in your pocket and you just want to like spend it um, because that next purchase that you make may bring on some sort of like serotonin or dopamine. And so it doesn't necessarily make me a shopaholic per se, but um, with the impulse mix with the inability to have that like broad time horizon to be able to plan out, you know, uh, utilities or different bills that are coming up, um, it makes it difficult for me to be able to budget properly. Like I walk through the mall and if you are able to catch my attention and catch it quickly and make it seem appealing, you got a sale as long as I got in my checking account. So it, it's, uh, it's kind of shameful to admit that, but at the same time, uh, you know, it is what it is. I don't think, I'm not in debt, like, well, not terrible debt. I'm not bankrupt, so I got a decent credit score, so I guess it hasn't completely screwed me yet. So relationships with ADHD can get a little tricky for a number of different reasons. You know, the thing with ADHD is that, um, Neurodivergent people, which is a, a term that I'll use for people who have, say, autism or ADHD, something that makes their brain function differently, um, you tend to interact with the world differently and other people may not understand that and they, may, they might receive that as rude or they might just not understand kind of how you're functioning and how you're interacting. Uh, so one of the things that I notice is that people with ADHD get so wrapped up in their passions and the things that they care about and the things that they hyper focus on that uh, they can forget about relationships and checking in on their friends and being the person to make that call and all of that stuff and it's not because they don't care about their friends but it's because sometimes they're just so zeroed in like narrow focused on that thing that they are really enjoying at the time. Uh, another thing is lateness. Uh, definitely, I think we can all agree that people can view that as rude. Uh, people with ADHD have difficulty with something called time horizons. So it might be 10, 15, and someone knows that they have to be somewhere at 11 o'clock. Uh, difficulty with time horizons might mean that they think that they have time to tidy up their room, do their makeup, um, and just do a number of things before they leave the house, and then they can still get there on time. When in reality, they're, they're not accurately planning out how long the, those tasks actually take them and how long it will actually take them to get where they need to be, which can often lead people with ADHD to being late, which can definitely be viewed as rude by friends. Also, forgetfulness plays a huge part in difficulty with relationships. If you have trouble remembering someone's birthday or remembering an important date you had with someone or if you planned an outing with someone and you forget, that can be very offensive to other people. So it can be difficult to have relationships because people view, you know, you're forgetting something as you not caring when genuinely you have trouble actively remembering certain details. Also, difficulty with disorganization and what others may view as messiness can be difficult in obviously intimate relationships where you're living with someone else and you might not organize the way they organize or you might have things all over the place and that can cause a lot of conflict within relationships. I would say that um, I have been so um, involved in the musicals that I've been doing and the activities over the years that I haven't really invested a lot of time into 
um, having friends as most people would know it. The way that I work best with people is if we have a project that we're working on together, then we become friends. That's kind of how it works. Like um, when I direct a musical, I usually have to hire a costume designer. I hire a couple directors, choreographer, backstage manager, lighting. I hire all these people and we become friends during that time. And then when the musical's over, then I get a whole new set of friends for the next musical. So my friends and my social life has changed quite a bit depending on what musical we're doing at the time. Or if I'm producing a, ch a children's musical, I'll become friends with those parents. And then when the musical's over, it's on to the next one. I feel like uh, when you have ADHD, when you have uh kind of this natural predisposure to uh, being confused or being short of memory or any of those other symptoms that we're all familiar with or maybe not familiar with. Um, sometimes people don't know how to cope with or deal with your behavior a lot of the time. So it has a tendency and even uh, in your career path, for example, uh, your job, um, I feel like uh, I annoy my co coworkers a lot of the time. Um, and as a child, I, I knew that um, essentially that it just made me harder to deal with. Um, when I was a kid growing up, as far as my parents were concerned. Um, so yeah, um, I don't want to say the world sees you in like an ultra negative light, but it definitely, um, it makes you kind of feel like you need to walk on eggshells a little bit. So it can definitely need some self-esteem issues and stuff like that too. Parenting with ADHD is something I'm still learning, honestly. It's, it's, you know, I'm, the way I was raised, it's like I'm, you know, I wasn't raised around, like you, you grew up with ADHD, so you know the struggles and the things like that that you experience. So I think you have more of connection with what Ari's dealing with more than what I do, because I'm, you know, right now it really doesn't, like some of the little different behaviors doesn't really kind of register or connect with me like why they're happening and things like that because it's a lot of I would say repeating things um, constant redirect the issue is that she has trouble remembering directions and so when you give a direction sometimes you have to give it a few extra times than a neurotypical child and so that can make things a little bit difficult yeah. for you because in my experience I guess I'm I'm very aware of what it feels like to be told something and completely forget what I was told and that I need to hear those instructions again. And I think that when I, um, when I have that experience, it's growing up, I was afraid to ask for help and I was afraid to ask for clarification because I was afraid that the teacher or someone was gonna be like, I already said that, or I already told you that. So I would not ask for help. I, to this day, I'm working through like asking for help when I need it because I would see other kids who had, you know, problems with attention and I would see them get in trouble for asking about something the teacher just said. So I literally learned to like not not ask that I would like whisper to someone next to me to get directions or I'd like try to look around and see what everyone else was doing once teachers gave directions and so when I'm dealing with my daughter who has those same concerns I'm like very patient with her about like I know she needs the directions a couple more times it's a process and me growing up not dealing with this is like this has been an eye-opener I I you know I had kids growing up with me and classmates had ADHD, you know, I didn't really know what it was or how it really affected anyone or any families and things like that. So this has been an eye opener and something that I need to work on and learn and adjust to and, you know, this is my family. So, you know, have to make it work. The biggest issue that I ran into was the kind of impulse control again at that point. Um, 
I think it's really easy to hang out with people just because, you know, it's the next party or hangout or something to do. And so that also offers a dopamine or a serotonin hit. And so when you're going into these relationships or hanging out with certain people, there's a lot of things that you're kind of blinded to because, um, you know, are these people the right people for me or should I be, you know, hanging out with this person should I not you know all of those things that kind of go into building a friendship um, kind of get lost I guess the best way to put it is there's a lot of times where you make friends that aren't really your friends um, and so you kind of go through life kind of cycling out people because you finally realize that like maybe that person isn't for you because or they're not good for you um, because you were just in it for that impulsive opportunity I've grown some relationships. So over the past couple of years, especially since I found out, um, I was able to share my story with other people and it be an inspiration and motivate people. And so I didn't, I didn't realize, you know, it would be that way. For a while, I was embarrassed about it. And so, you know, being vulnerable and just open with people, um, I feel some friendships, um, some mentoring relationships as well. So I think it's been a positive thing. So work life with ADHD um, can be good in certain situations and I, I like to tell people that when you find the right fit and what works for you, then you can really thrive and be an asset to a company. Um, and when you're in a situation that isn't for you and, or does not work with the way that your brain works, it definitely can be very difficult and I hear a lot of different stories about people, you know, getting written up or having difficulty at work for, you know, being late or for not keeping track of certain things or staying organized. Uh, so that can be a difficult thing with work life. But people with ADHD are also very creative. They can think outside of the box. They can come up with quick solutions. Um, they thrive under pressure, whereas a neurotypical person might have difficulty when things get hectic and there's a lot going on at the same time. People with ADHD have a lot going on in their brain all the time anyway. So when it comes to a high pressure situation, it's very easy for someone with ADHD to adjust and kind of quickly find those solutions and be able to do their best and actually probably do better than when there isn't any pressure. So when it comes to careers, um, obviously anything in the creative arts, anything that's you know, you have something that you have to do right then and it's very important such as nursing um, or being a firefighter or working at a restaurant. And it really depends on the person because ADHD isn't your whole entire being, but also who you are as a person plays a part in which career would be best. But for the most part, constant moving with people who are primarily hyperactive is really helpful. Um, and then for inattentive people, having the ability to work when their brain is ready to work instead of having to sit down and focus for a long period of time is best. I major in computer science, so that is basically problem solving and with some, some creativity. Um, a lot of logic, but I think with my personality, with the creativity, with the problem solving, it goes hand in hand. So I know that, you know, for computer scientists, typically, you know, like it's just numbers, you know, math, um, so to speak. And so having that extra, you know, uh, boost of creativity um, really helps me out with that. And so I think it's been awesome. I think it, it you know, having that my, my brain is, you know, not neurotypical, um, it really helps me, you know, pivot and look at problems in a different way. So as far as computer science goes, I think um, having ADHD, I guess maybe it, it could have contributed to that being the, the choice, my career choice. Um, so I was moving up in the ranks and uh, just transferring to various hotels and helping out um, until I received a promotion where there was a lot more independence, much like how my experience was with college. Um, things were falling through the cracks, um, but it was more, I had more responsibility at that point. It was no longer someone holding my hand. There was no longer a counselor that was there to help me through it. Um, 
where I was getting, you know, write-ups and kind of different uh, disciplinary actions uh, against my performance at work. And I kind of knew at that point that there was an issue um, because there were so many things where I was trying to get assistance and see what the issue is on my own. Um, but at that point where you know I was getting in trouble so many times that I decided to seek help um, and see a psychiatrist about possibly having ADHD. Um, so once kind of everything came tumbling down and I got my diagnosis, um, I was able to then thrive again um, and have a successful career. <laughs> my current career? Probably negatively at this point. Um, because I definitely, within the past few months, a lot of my symptoms have kind of started to resurface almost. Um, not that it ever completely went away from me, but definitely in my adult years, in my 20s, uh, my symptoms were a lot more subdued compared to my teens and um, my early childhood. But recently, uh, especially since the uh, pandemic has gone on, I definitely feel that my ability to focus isn't as good or sharp and just I don't feel optimal so to speak. So, um, <laughs> I totally lost my train of thought. See, there you go, right there. Um, yeah, so it just essentially makes it harder to get things done. So as far as my current career, probably hasn't been very helpful to me, but, and then it also has its benefits because I feel like ADHD allows you to kind of almost um, get more in touch with your creative side too. So uh, ADHD people are very talented, so, and we have a tendency to hyper-focus so the things that we are interested in, um, for example, music and dance and stuff like that, I think it actually is in some capacity been helpful and even given me inspiration in a lot of ways. In the performing arts for most of my adult life, um, I've been a performer. My primary instrument is a keyboard or a piano. Um, I write music, and I also um, mentor others in music and the arts. Um, I've also produced over a hundred musicals, um, so I'm I've been a musical theater producer. Uh, I'm also a music producer. I've self-produced several albums. I'm also a writer. Uh, so I call myself a multidisciplinary artist, um, with, the, with the emphasis being on writing, theater, and, and music primarily. Um, but yeah, I've been involved in the arts for, gosh, over 20 years. I have my own business called Ozaki Talent, which is just north of Milwaukee. I read this in a book and I can't say exactly who said it, but um, when someone has ADHD, it's like their brain is on energy saving mode for the things that are important for them. And so when we talk about the brain functioning of ADHD, dopamine, the neurotransmitter dopamine is the key neurotransmitter that plays a part in ADHD. This neurotransmitter is responsible for your reward um, and pleasure. So. A neurotypical person might know that they have to do something and so they'll just do it and so you have neurons in your brain that send messages to one another to get you to do what you need to do. And so with ADHD, when it's something that you're not interested in or something that's not high risk or something that's not extremely stimulating, um, the dopamine will not be absorbed in the target neuron as it's supposed to. And so because of that, you might not be able to, you know, fold your clothes when you, you should or tidy up or do those mundane tasks and the, the boring things in life or the things that you're not interested in. But on the other hand, um, that dopamine gets released even more in activities that you're interested in. So a lot of people with ADHD are able to hyper-focus, and that's what that hyper-focus is, is that dopamine that wasn't absorbed for laundry is now absorbed for something that you really, really love and you're passionate about. 
and someone can spend days and days, you know, reading about things that they love, participating in activities that they're interested in, and then they can actually become even more knowledgeable and even more, um, they can become experts in things that they are interested in and passionate about. And that's another thing about ADHDers is that they're extremely passionate people and they're very, um, they love learning and, and love kind of, they keep the curiosity that we have in childhood. You know, children, when they're first seeing the world, it, everything is new. And so everything, they wanna know more about it, they wanna explore it. And people with ADHD kind of maintain that curiosity through their entire lives, which can be helpful in so many different ways. I'm an out-of-the-box thinker, so I think that that has um, lended itself to me being a, more entrepreneurial. Um, I'm also uh, good at uh, creating quick and easier processes to do things and other great resources for places that have limited resources. Um, I've had to overcompensate by being highly detail-oriented. Um, I have excellent producing skills. I'm also very healthy because I exercise a lot. I swim every morning. That really helps me. And I'm excellent with children. I've worked with children a lot. I've, I've enjoyed teaching. I've enjoyed working in the arts. I love learning. Um, I'm excellent at creative writing. That was a strength that I had even as a child. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, was creative writing. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, being a producer is really excellent for people with ADHD. The positive for me is the ability to be creative and think outside of the box. Um, I have always been like an artistic person. I danced for many, many years. I played violin. Um, I paint now. That's something that is the next career or hobby or what have you that I'm looking to go into. Um, but I think even in my professional and friendships and other relationships, it's just the ability to have those thoughts or ideas that are innovative that someone who's neurotypical may not have because they are, tend to be a little bit more cookie cutter and more um, predictable in a way. So it's kind of like that unpredictable, um, spontaneous flair that I kind of bring to life and to all of the aspects of my life. I definitely give it, I feel like it gives me um, kind of a more creative approach to problem solving and looking at things. When, when you have ADHD, your mind is constantly racing, so I feel like you have so many more thoughts on average than the average person does. So it leads you to kind of like creative solutions or creative ideas with things. So I definitely feel like for, um, it's been helpful in that instance, and I'm someone that's made music. Um, I like to write, dance, I like artsy things. So I think it's been helpful in that sense. And um, I think experiencing it and kind of dealing with it, it has also made me a kind of more sensitive and understanding person in general too. So I'm thankful for that, and I feel like that's, once you get to that point with it, um, you can kind of be an asset to other people who are struggling with it too. Something about society when it comes to disability in general is that most of the time it's not the person with the disability who is struggling with what they have going on. It's usually other people around them that's struggling with what that person has going on. Um, the people around them being frustrated that they have to repeat directions or, or being frustrated that that person can't sit in their chair and quietly all day. Um, so one thing that I would say if you're working with someone who has ADHD or you notice those issues is kind of 
taking a step back first and foremost and thinking, uh, what has society taught me about how people should be and why is that? And then kind of going from there on like learning what are the strengths and the benefits of the way that this person is and how can I use those first and foremost before addressing all of the things that we view as deficits. It looks different for different people. So, you know, some people may have a super chronic form um, where it, it is very hard for them to function and do what seems to be everyday simple activities. So, you know, me calling it a superpower is that I researched and, and not just research ADHD, I look within myself and I notice things. And I think, I don't know if I would call it, I don't know, maybe an advantage, not an advantage, but I didn't find out until later. And so when I was talking with doctors, they were like, you're amazing. You made it to a PhD program with ADHD. Like you did all these things. And one of the things that the doctor said was, you know, you being an athlete, you having, you know, being a part of all these different organizations gave you structure. You had these routines, you had responsibilities. And then after I, you know, wasn't playing sports on a collegiate level, I wasn't, you know, in a lot of clubs and things, I found other things to do. So I would go and work out. I would wake up really early and um, run, although I hated it. I would run, I would, you know, keep snacks beside me. I would download these, uh, these timers to make sure I ate. And this is before I found out. I just knew myself enough to know like, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm like reading this page and I don't know what I just read for the last 20 minutes. So let me go and like play on my Nintendo. Yes, I still have a Nintendo. You know, doing these things, these were, these were actually things that the doctors would tell people who had been diagnosed to do. And so she was like, I don't know what, what we can do for you. Other than, like you, you've done all the things. And so having an understanding of who I am and how things work for me, I think that's how I got to the superpower. And so I didn't have ADHD define me initially to where I bought in and went, okay, well, I have this thing and these are the things I can't do. Because another thing is if you tell me I can't do something, then that's like motivation for me to absolutely do it. And so, you know, yeah, so that's my journey. If you want more information on what I do, you can visit my website at GloriaJoySherrod.com. There you can purchase my book and also my coaching services. I do one-on-one -on -one and group ADHD coaching for adults and teens. And then some other things that I have in the works are grant funding for people with ADHD who are looking to get a certificate, go back to school, or start their own business. Um, and I also am working on having a YouTube channel where I kind of share some more information about ADHD regularly. So if you go to my website, you can find all of that information on how you can help support. <music>